to give you a little bit of a C51-101. And in some regards, I'm pretty sure I'm talking to people who know an awful lot about C51. Um, but let's at least start from some kind of common ground. To let you know, C51, which was originally introduced as anti-terrorism legislation, is nothing of the kind. It is not. You will find very few references to terrorism in C51. Uh, in the main, it is national security legislation, with national security defined in the broadest and most sweeping terms. It is really fair to say that we have not seen anything that has reshaped the landscape of national security in Canada so profoundly since we saw the first ATA, Anti-Terrorism Act, just post 9-11. Legal scholars and national security scholars have said that this legislation is quite radical. It introduces things into Canadian law that we've actually never seen before. And so I want to walk you through just the five major components, all of which deserves a conference of its own to pull apart. But we're just going to keep things nice and tight and allow um, the discussion to pick up which elements we'd like to um, tease out a little further. But the five main components I just want to run by you starting with the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act. So, this is an omnibus bill. That means it changes all, it introduces new bills, new acts, and it also changes existing acts. This is a portion of C-51, and I'm still gonna call it C-51, even though it actually is, we've passed, right? It's an act. C-51 is the brand we all know, I'm gonna stick with that. Um, so, the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act is arguably the piece of C-51 that brought out those thousands of thousands of people to various demonstrations. Because people understood this was a broad-based surveillance bill. What it does is it allows the government, of the federal government, to information share for the purposes of national security, again, defined like we've never seen national security defined before, amongst 17 different federal agencies, including all the national security policing intelligence agencies, plus all the agencies that we are not used to seeing part of the national security landscape, like Health Canada, Canada Revenue Agency, Veterans Affairs, etc. So the idea about sharing this information is clearly one of increasing the amount of surveillance in the national security sphere. But it's important to understand that we're not talking about discrete bits of information necessarily, where say CSIS could go to the Canada Revenue Agency and say, hey, we're interested in a couple of people here. Do you have some information on them? We'd like it for national security purposes. Now, that scenario I'm thinking very, very um, pointedly because it was the, re the news in a recent um, report that CSIS got whacked on the hand for doing that very thing. Hey, CRA, give us some information. We're just checking out a couple of people. The story on that was, hey, they weren't supposed to do that. They broke the rules. That was the headline. It should have been the headline, and now they can do as much of that as they want to. No, bigger headline. Now they can take the whole database. That's the part of C51 that we really need to bring into focus if we're looking at the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act. Nothing requires individualized suspicion in this act. If I were the national security agencies, I'd go after whole databases, and that's the suspicion among privacy experts in this country. They're looking for databases. Why? Because we don't do national security the way that we used to. Now the movement, and this is the movement that has really been brought forward by our Five Eyes partners, our intelligence sharing partners, the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and ourselves, is to collect everything. Why? Because we want to risk score everyone. Everyone is now a suspect in the national security paradigm. So the point here is, when we're talking about, surely we need good information sharing for national security purposes. That's very true. But the scope and the sweep of the Security of Canada Information Sharing Bill has got to be understood in relation to how broad those powers are, 
what they intend to do with them, and believe me, it will not be an individualized suspicion standard. You have to understand big data and big data analytics to know what they're planning to do with these large databases. So that's, that's as I say, the piece that has brought out a whole bunch of folks. But of course, that's not all. We've got four others to go through. How am I doing? Good enough. Um, US style no fly lists. Canada has had since 2007 the Passenger Protect Program. We have had the Made in Canada version of the no fly list. What the new no fly list does is bring in two lists. And again, I just want to highlight here how there's been a little bit of confusion in the media. You know those um, small Muslim children who are apparently on the no fly list? Remember that? They're not. They're on the slow fly list. We have two lists. No fly, the one that actually keeps you off an airplane. Slow fly, the one that subjects you to further scrutiny on the basis of criteria that you could never know and never appeal. That's what those children are on, the slow fly list. Our new no fly regime <coughs> gives you an incredible snowball's hope in hell of getting yourself off the no fly list. You would have to apply in writing once you are unable to board an airplane. By the by, nobody will tell you that you are on the no-fly list. Right? It's, we get very Kafka-esque here when we deal with no-fly. You'll just have to figure out that the fact you're not being allowed on the airplane is because you're from the no-fly list. You appeal to the minister and say, I shouldn't be on this list. The minister will ignore you for three months. That's considered an answer. And if they ignore you for three months, they consider that answer to be, no, you're fine. At which point, you can go to federal court. In federal court, you may or may not be told what you were put on the no-fly list for. In fact, they can hold the entire hearing in secret, if they wish. This is the level of due process that the US started out with that has recently been found unconstitutional in the US. We have decided on a no-fly scheme that mirrors what they started with, and we already know the horror story that has engendered. The slow fly list sucks to the U. There is actually no process to get yourself off the slow fly list. And again, it is forbidden for you to even be told that you're on it. So this is the level of due process that clearly is ripe for constitutional challenge. But the further thing we need to note about the no fly list, if we look to our friends in America to see what it is really for, given that there is no empirical data anywhere to support the proposition that this increases the safety of the skies. What it has been used for, and is very effective for, is recruiting informants. So we are seeing in the United States, people waiting until people travel abroad, put them on the no-fly list so they can't come home, send intelligence agents to them and say, we're happy to put you to rights to get home on this airplane, provided you become an informant for intelligence. That kind of pressure is what no-fly lists are very effective at. As I say, no empirical evidence that otherwise they improve the safety of the skies. That's the second piece. The third piece is the extension of powers of preventative detention. Again, we could go on on this. Preventative detention is an extraordinary power where you are, in fact, arresting someone on the basis of the suspicion of what they are going to do. Bill C-51, we've had this provision for some time, has extended the amount of time they can be held for and lowered the standard for that holding. Um, and as well, we see the um, new speech offenses. So the new speech offenses include criminalizing the promotion of terrorism in general. You're asking yourself, what does that mean? And I'm telling you as a lawyer, no one knows. This is one of those places, again, where we have a concept that is absolutely novel in Canadian law. We don't know what this language means. This is obviously deeply of concern to all kinds of free speech advocates, but as well, it was a con of concern to security experts who say this is exactly the wrong way to go about looking at a national security program in which you want de-radicalization programs, you want to know who's who and what's what and who's thinking what, this is the wrong way to go about it. So arguably bad security policy, certainly just dire for chilling freedom of expression. And then finally we have um, a, 
one of the pieces that everyone, again, is very concerned about, which is the radical reshaping and redefining of the role of CSIS. CSIS is our domestic intelligence agency. And since the um, McDonald Commission and the creation of CSIS, the thinking was that our intelligence agents should be separate from our national security policing. In part because while your intelligence agents may be, it may be permissible, and in fact is arguably quite needful, that they do some of their work in secret to gather intelligence. Secret intelligence has some place in a democracy. Secret policing, no place in a democracy. Which is why we created CSIS so that its intelligence branch would give intelligence to policing arms that have to act transparently. Now, with CSIS given policing powers, kinetic powers, allowed to take measures to interrupt national security concerns, we effectively have a secret police. And so the concern about accountability, transparency, oversight, review, judicial authorization, all spring from various aspects of C-51, but are really harnessed in this final one, the recasting of our domestic spies as domestic secret police. Now, there is a provision in C-51 for CSIS to go to a court to get a warrant if what they are planning to do in their disruption powers is likely to impact on the constitutional rights of someone. I'll tell you, legal scholars have had just a field day with this. Absolutely a field day. Because it is as if the drafters have fundamentally misconceived the role of the courts and the Constitution. Courts aren't there to sanction breaches of the Constitution. They're there to make sure breaches of the Constitution don't happen, right? So unlike where you have a search warrant, where when the court sanctions a search warrant, it turns an unreasonable search and seizure into a reasonable search because that's the nature of our right. We have a right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. But that's a very, very, very specific kind of right. Most of our rights don't have that qualifier. There is no unreasonable, cruel, and unusual punishment. It's all unreasonable. You can't quantify that, qualify it, by having a court order. So asking the courts to do that work is simply anathema, and for many legal scholars, a non-starter. And that would be one of the places that we are likely to see um, sort of low-hanging fruit for a constitutional challenge. But the entire framework of allowing CSIS to have this policing power is really the bigger container that this concern is in, and it certainly includes the warrant provisions. So um, that's my time. Um, like I said, that was the summarize and Proust version, right? That's about as fast as it gets. But those are the five main pieces, and like I said, happy to pull it apart uh, a little later, and I'm sure some of the other speakers will um, touch on those as well. Thanks, Carmen.